guys. Um, this is pretty weird for me. I'm not quite used to making videos of myself yet. Um, but welcome to my home office slash guest bedroom. Um, uh, my kids are just on the other side of the store watching television right now. I hope we don't get interrupted. We are just in strange times right now. It's going to take a lot of adjustment for us. Um, but we'll see. We'll, we'll see how this goes. Um, I hope you're all coping pretty well. Um, I have some, some business items to discuss first. So I am working really hard to figure out how to really effectively move this course online, still make it fun and interesting and, and worth your time. Um, it's going to be a process though to figure it out. So um, I, I also want to be very mindful of where you guys are, what's going on with you, if you have internet connection or not reliably. Um, I understand that some of you may have had to leave campus or haven't been able to get back to, into your dorms yet, so you may not have access to your books um, or maybe even laptops, I'm not sure. Um, and some of you just might be in a strange place. Um, so we're all just going to try to figure this out as we go along. Um, I am still hoping that I can set up at least one, if not more, sort of online together class discussions and where we can meet virtually again. I'm just not sure if that's gonna work out. So I'm trying this format first, this video format, and we'll see how it goes. Um, this might be the most boring, painful video of all time for you to watch. I apologize for that. Uh, we're, just, we're just gonna see what we can do though. Um, so here's your instructions. Um, I'm gonna spend some time talking about the book, okay? Um, and raising some questions and sort of talking through some things and then you uh, will comment below here. This is a YouTube video, comments are open. And um, so you'll need to leave a comment responding to either something I've said um, or something else that you found interesting from the book and sort of want to bring up. So your own comment and then you will also be required to uh, re respond to someone else's comment. So reply to someone else's comment. So that means you might need to come back later in the week as more people have watched and, and left comments to respond. Um, I might be responding to some of your comments too if some interesting things come up. But this is this is the best way I can think of right now to sort of create a discussion space, watching this video and commenting on it below. Um, so we'll see how this works out, all right? Um, okay, on to the book. Uh, you all should have finished reading The Emperor's Soul at this point, and I hope you enjoyed, oh, it's upside down. Sorry, hey, there we go, Emperor's Soul. Um, this is one of my favorite Sanderson books. I find more things to like about it um, the more times I, I read it, and this is probably my fourth or fifth time reading it. Um, so the first thing I want to discuss and talk about is the way that writing is involved in this magic system. Now you already had your short writing question, you should have already finished your short writing questions where you've already sort of talked about that. Um, so I'm just going to think through some ideas here. Um, you, and you also all should have watched the video about Chinese stamps, right, where the inspiration for this book came from. Um, but what you hopefully got out of that video is that um, these stamps, this system of stamp writing, really might blur the line between pictorial art and writing, um, at least for the real stamps, the way they work um, in real East Asian culture. Uh, some of them are more just um, pictorial, right? Just a picture of a person or, or, or some sort of uh, beautiful image and maybe less connected but still somewhat connected to letters or words or sounds or, or me some sort of meaningful phrase. The line is very blurred there. Um, so that's the first question. Are these stamps still considered writing? Um, and what I, would, what I would say, at least this is my opinion, my opinion, at least for in this book, the way this magic system seems to work in this book, um, I think it is still writing. I think we can still count it as writing, um, or at least meaningful words of some sort. And the reason why I, th I think that is because, um, well, first off, it gets, it gets referred to as writing, 
um, Shai refers to it as rewriting a soul or rewriting a history. Um, and there's communication happening, right? The stamp, when it is stamped in an object, seems to be communicating. Um, so I think that's one of the reasons why I do consider it writing. Um, but let me know your thoughts and opinions on are, what are these symbols and do they count? It does it count as an official writing, magic writing, okay? So the second major question that you also should have written about already in your short writing that I'm interested in exploring is um, that relationship between this written language, right, and the inanimate object, um, the inanimate object being able to understand this written language. So uh, this is not a comparative religion course, but um, since we know, we already know that Sanderson is drawing from East Asian cultural influences and in creating this fictional world, I thought that there was possible, possibly some um, connection to East Asian religious philosophy in this, in this magic system. Um, so I asked you to read that article on Buddhist materiality. Now, um, I'll, I'll need to explain. So the article, maybe, hopefully you already picked this up after reading it. The article itself is a review of a book on Buddhist materiality. Um, rather than having you read an excerpt from that book or, you know, like uh, getting more complicated, I thought that this review article gave us a nice overview of the book itself and the arguments and gave us a brief little summary. So that's why I chose to do this review article. I hope you were able to mostly understand it because um, I thought it gave a nice little, a, a good summary. And it may have been maybe a little bit difficult to follow, but the main argument I wanted you to identify is that, um, in many tenets of Buddhism, especially the way we here in the West are familiar with Buddhism, we think that it, it tends to eschew uh, material form, that um, material objects are less important, of lesser importance, and that it's, you know, um, very in the mind, um, going inward, um, right, that, that sort of thing, and which I think is true. But the author of this book, Fabio Rambelli, he is making this argument that at least in Japanese Buddhism, so this segment of Buddhism, there have, there's this history of arguments for the sentience, or sentience of non-human objects. Um, or in other words, this idea that plants specifically is one that they bring up, but other objects, other sacred objects, um, can obtain enlightenment, that the objects themselves have, uh, soul might not be the right word. It is in the book, but in, in reality it may not be the right word, but they, ha they have um, some sort of consciousness, a consciousness that can uh, want and desire and improve and become, right? Um, so, and that, that philosophy is possibly influenced by um, Shintoism, which is a separate Japanese religion not, that's not Buddhism. And Shintoism, um, it's more of a cultural belief system, but they believe in that there are countless numbers of gods or spirits in the world, and that many of these spirits inhabit inanimate objects. Um, so, I'm not necessarily an expert in any of this field beyond what we read in the article and what a few Wikipedia searches have told me, but um, there is a facet of uh, this East Asian religious philosophy that might be inspiring Brandon Sanderson here. Um, so while certain parts of Buddhism may not place much importance on the material object or, or whether the material object is sent sentient or not, um, at least in this book, right, it's very important to the magic system. Um, this idea that inanimate objects, that non-human objects, um, have desires, have wants. So I'm actually going to, if you open up to page 53, if you have the same edition as me, I don't know if there's multiple editions of this. I'm assuming most of you have this edition. If you open up to page 53, this is where Shai is explaining how the magic system works. And what's interesting to know is that this world seems to have different factions, different religious factions, or at least different belief systems. So her view of how the world works 
is not necessarily accepted by the majority culture, but it is the view of how this magic system operates. So here's how she explains it. Um, <clears throat> all things exist in three realms, Gawatona. Physical, cognitive, spiritual. The physical is what we feel, what is before us. So phys the physical world, what is actually in front of us. The cognitive is how an object views itself. No, no, sorry. Is how an object is viewed and how it views itself. Okay, so that's pretty interesting. Objects have, can view themselves a certain way. Then the spiritual realm contains an object's soul, its essence, as well as the ways it is connected to the things and people around it. Um, so really interesting, what, what we need to take out of this is that um, inanimate objects and animate objects, people, animals, humans, everything, everything has an essence, okay? We're getting back to our Play-Doh here. Everything has an essence, and that is its soul that exists in this spiritual realm. Um, they have an identity. They are essentially something. So Sanderson isn't necessarily concerned with naming these essences, with giving them words, but this magic system does seem to be able to communicate with that essence, right? These stamps make contact with something in the physical realm, and they are able to communicate in the cognitive and spiritual realm with the essence of this object, and they're able to tell it to be something or, or, or change its memories or change its view of itself somehow, um, which I find really interesting, a really interesting system, right? Um, that maybe doesn't make a whole lot of sense in reality, but the, it's very keyed in on this idea that things have an essence, and not just an essence, but desires and wants and a way that they view themselves, inanimate as well as animate, right? Um, so one of the ideas that's important for the magic system is this idea of the stamp taking, right? Um, Will the object take the stamp or will it reject the stamp? And this is a very interesting idea, right? The stamps will only take if the message written on the stamp is related enough to the essence of the object, to its truth, right? I don't know. The idea of truth is, the theme of truth is really interesting in this book. Um, and its relationship to forgery right? So everyone else in this culture seems to believe that what Shai does is all about lying, all about um, falsehood and faking and forgery. The term is forgery, right? But, but what's interesting about the magic system is that it doesn't actually work unless it is connected to some element of truth about the essence of the thing, right? So, so let me give you a few examples from the text of this. Um, like if you go to page 47, uh, I think it's 47. Wait, maybe it's not. Um, doo -doo -doo. Dang it, where is it? Um, the stained glass window. Um, actually page no no I'm not gonna find it where do we talk about the stained glass window oh right here sorry page 65 okay there we go sorry I got that wrong page 65 okay I'll just read this little excerpt to you this is new Gautona said inspecting the stained glass window that had been a particularly pleasing bit of inspiration on Shai's part attempts to forge the window to a better version of itself had repeatedly failed each time, after five minutes or so, the window had reverted to its crack, cracked, gap-sided self. Then Shai had found a bit of colored glass rammed into one side of the frame. The window, she realized, had once been a stained glass piece, like many in the palace. 
It had been broken, and whatever had shattered the window had also bent the frame, producing those gaps that let in the frigid breeze. Rather than repairing it as it had been meant to be, someone had put ordinary glass into the window and left it to crack. A stamp from Shy in the bottom right corner had restored the window, rewriting its history so that a caring master craftsman had discovered the fallen window and remade it. That seal had taken immediately. Even after all this time, the window had seen itself as something beautiful. Okay, I, I love that, right? So, is her stamp, turning it back into a stained glass window, is that a forgery? Is it a fake? Or is it actually a truer version? Because it's how the object itself views itself right? Interesting relationship between um, truth and forgery in this magic system, truth and fakeness, um, and what something's true self actually is. Let's take a look at another example. This one is on page 110. Um, okay, um, and this is when she uh, she's recreated a wall in her room to look like a mural, to be a beautiful mural of um, vines and flowers and branches and, and things like that. Um, so Gavaton is asking her how she did it. And she, she explains, um, one of the strikers guarded Atsuko of Jindo during his visit to the Rose Palace, she said. Atsuko caught a sickness and was stuck in his bedroom for three weeks. That was just one floor up. Your forgery puts him in this room instead? Yes. That was before the water damage that seeped through the ceiling last year, so it's plausible he'd have been placed here. The wall remembers Atsuko spending days too weak to leave, but having the strength for painting. A little each day, a growing pattern of vines, leaves, and berries to pass the time. This shouldn't be taking, Gawatona said. This forgery is tenuous. You've changed too much. So he's starting to understand how the magic system works. He understands that the thing itself or the, the change has to be related to what the, how the thing views itself, how it sees itself. No, Shai said, it's on the line, that line where the greatest beauty is found. She put the seal away. She barely remembered the last six hours. She had been caught up in the frenzy of creation. Still, Gawatona said. It will take, Shai said. If you were the wall, what would you rather be? Dreary and dull or alive with paint? So, <laughs> walls can't think, Gawatona says. That doesn't stop them from caring. All right, so I think this exchange is super interesting because here it doesn't necessarily seem to be related so much to the truth of the object as what the object desires, what it wants, um, that it desires something, that it cares. It cares about what it is. Um, so anyway, interesting, interesting relationships here about how this magic system communicates with inanimate objects, how inanimate objects can have desires and things and, and thoughts, well, maybe thoughts, um, and how truth relates to the idea of forgery here. Um, so that's inanimate objects. So let's talk about What's far more interesting about this magic system, how it works with the complicated souls of humans, right? Shaisin indicates, tells them repeatedly over and over that it is a thousand times more difficult to change a human soul using one of these stamps um, because they're far more complex. Humans have much more complex desires and wants, right? But if you stop and think about this, it's like, it's like a almost, I feel like it's almost a reversal. It's really interesting that it is easier for these words, for these symbols to communicate with an inanimate object than it is for these words and symbols to communicate with a human soul, right? Doesn't that almost seem backward? But um, that same principle applies in this magic system that in order for these symbols to, have, to, to be able to enact on the object, the soul itself must believe it, okay? So um, 
the, a person can't be changed by one of these stamps unless, unless their soul already agrees with the change. Um, so really interesting. And there's, there's all sorts of other interesting things to think about here, about this relationship between this magic system and people and humans and analyzing human character. So I just want to talk about a few of those, a few moments where some interesting ideas are brought up about understanding people. Um, one of those is on page 105, so I'm going to jump there really quick. Let's see. Okay, so this is where Shai is talking to Gautona about the idea of control, right? Um, people, Shai said, rising to fetch another seal, by nature, attempt to exercise power over what is around them. We build walls to shelter us from the wind, roofs to stop the rain. We tame the elements, bend nature to our wills. It makes us feel as if we're in control. Except in doing so, we merely replace one influence with another. Instead of the wind affecting us, it is a wall, a man-made wall. The fingers of man's influence are all about touching everything. Man-made rugs, man-made food. Every single thing in the city that we touch, see, feel, experience comes as the result of some person's influence. We may feel in control, but we never truly are unless we understand people. Controlling our environment is no longer about blocking the wind. It's about knowing why the serving lady was crying last night, or why a particular guard always loses, a, loses at cards, or why your employer hired you in the first place. So I don't know if this is related to the magic system directly, but indirectly it is. It's this idea that you have to understand something in order to control it. Um, you have to know its truth in order, you have to know who it is and what it is and why it's doing something and what it wants. You have to know what it wants in order to change it, right? And it's true for the inanimate objects as it is for people. You have to know people in order to control, and controlling people sounds really like awful, but, <laughs> or the idea of controlling people. Um, but the idea is there in order to, um, influence to affect things, you have to understand the desires of the people around you. Okay, um, let's jump to page 113, right? Here's another interesting, um, another interesting idea about people in this magic system. Um, so uh, this is, this is where uh, Gautona says actually says something. Um, you have a temper, Gautona said, like him. Actually, I know exactly how that feels now, because you have given it to me on several occasions. I wonder if this thing you do could be a tool for helping to bring awareness to people. Inscribe your emotions onto a stamp, then let others feel what it is to be you. Uh, sounds great, Shai said, if only forging souls weren't a horrible offense to nature. So, this is really interesting. Um, what he's, what he's thinking through here is this idea that this magic system, this way of communicating to a soul could be a way of helping people understand each other, <laughs> could be a way of helping them feel empathy. Empathy is the word, it's not mentioned here, but you could actually feel what someone else is feeling by stamping a piece of their soul onto you. Um, it happens through language. S so my thought here is, is the stamp actually necessary? Or can we just say words about what we're feeling? Can we say words about our soul and have them communicate it to someone else? Oh, we, this is, this is a, this is a deep thought that's making me, because no, right? Um, just saying what we're feeling doesn't necessarily mean that everyone around us understands what we're feeling. Something about putting it on this, putting a word on this soul stamp, though, and then physically stamping it onto someone else, that communication is amplified. That soul is forced to understand, to feel, to, to like respond to the words, but it's still happening through language interesting really interesting i could talk a lot more about that think a lot more deeply about that anyway i'm not going to this is already super long i've got
All right, I have just one more passage that I want to talk about, the very, very end, um, and then we'll wrap this up. So this is, let's see, in the epilogue, very last page, where are we going to? Page 167 here. Um, and this is Gawatone after reading through her, the book of notes that she left him. Um, and he... Uh, says, uh, um, he found himself weeping, not for the future or for the emperor. These were the tears of a man who saw before himself a masterpiece. True art was more than beauty. It was more than technique. It was not just imitation. It was boldness. It was contrast. It was subtlety. In this book, Gautona found a rare work to rival that of the greatest painters, sculptors, and poets of any era. It was the greatest work of art he had ever witnessed. Gautona held that book reverently for most of the night. It was the creation of months of fevered, intense artistic transcendence, forced by external pressure, but released like a breath held until the brink of collapse, raw yet polished, reckless but calculated, awesome yet unseen. So it had to remain. If anyone discovered what Shai had done, the emperor would fall. Indeed, the very empire might shake. No one could know that Ashravan's decision to finally become a great leader had been set in motion by words etched into his soul by a blasphemer. As morning broke, Gautona slowly, excruciatingly stood up beside his hearth. He clutched the book, that matchless work of art, and held it out, then he dropped it into the flames. All right, we're gonna put a footnote on this point and come back to the idea of book burning in our next unit. Um, but some of the things that I wanna pull out of this passage. Um, first off, the idea of creation and art and, and um, what we're actually creating here. Um, in many ways, what Shai is doing in creating a soul is playing God, right? Playing God just a little bit, uh, because isn't that what God does? God creates souls, creates a person, except that there is a line. There's a difference here. She's actually, she's actually more like an author who is creating a character. Um, the character will never do anything that she hasn't already written into it. So that is different than God creating a fully autonomous person. Um, however, it's, it's still an act of creation. So there's, there's interesting parallels in, in that um, analogy, but also, but also differences. So what makes this makes the emperor, what makes her creation so, such a masterpiece is how complex that character is. Um, and I think that's, I think that's a really interesting and beautiful idea, thinking about art and creation and the relationship to truth, the relationship to, um, to language, right? Like she's creating the soul through words. Um, it even says that uh, this, his deci this Ashravan's decision to finally become a great leader had been set in motion by words etched into his soul. Oh, right? Um, it's, oh, anyway, so much there. So much to think about and pull apart if you want. But, and so much more I could talk about. There's so many other gems, little gems, things that I would love to discuss the politics and, and culture and lots of other things to talk about, but um, I've already taken up way too much of your time. This video is probably already the most boring thing you've ever seen. I've had a lot of fun making it though, just sitting here talking about books. My kind of, my kind of day. Um, anyway, we're going to leave our discussion there for now. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to leave your comments below. Um, and also feel free to let me know how you think this went. Um, watching a video and commenting like this, plus everything else the way I've set it up on Blackboard, feel free to let me know how it's going for you. Um, I'm excited for you to complete the rest of the steps for this week. I'm really looking forward to seeing your own designs, your own stamp designs, um, which I think is your next project. So good luck with that. Have fun with that. 
And if you haven't looked ahead to future weeks, well, there's just next week in this unit, um, just a reminder that your short analysis papers are due next week. We are going to be doing peer review of rough drafts and some revision stuff. So you need to have a rough draft ready to go early next week. Um, I will be posting all those instructions starting Monday. So there'll be instructions for how we're gonna manage peer review, instructions for submitting everything. Um, but don't forget about your short assignments and try to have it ready to go early next week, okay? And check back on Blackboard. I don't have um, Unit 3 up yet, but I will get Unit 3 up next week at some point so you can look ahead to future homework assignments. Working on that still, um, but we'll get there. Anyway, um, that's all for now. Take care.